Around 50% of marriages end in separation or divorce, but rarely do they attract as much attention as the marriage between Jean Nassif and Nissi Mattel. To most, Jean Nassif is a man who needs no introduction. He's the man who owes you money. He's the man who ruined your home. But something that is often overlooked is the fact that in his destructive path, the fugitive property developer ruined his own home, leaving behind a wife and three young children. Today, we are joined by Nassim Mattel as she reveals never before known facts regarding her marriage to Jean, as well as the impact it's had on herself, her friends and family, and perhaps most importantly, her three young children. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Joseph Majel with Ozara Media, and I'd like to welcome you to this very special interview today. Without further ado, it's time for us to get into it. Nessie, thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm good. After all, thank you for having me today. Thank you. Well, we're glad to have you. you. Um, obviously, I think it's important that we start at the beginning. How did you meet John Nassif? So when we met, I was only 20 and I was working uh, part time at a restaurant um, owned by my dad's friend. Yeah. I was also studying um, and I was also um, managing between making decisions between continuing my psychology degree that I never succeeded at due to the fact that I was horrible at math and statistics. Yeah, too. And I always was the performer growing up. I always wanted to be into acting and speaking and performing and um, just the world of performance. So uh, I was studying performing at the time as well. Um, and when I met John, he was, um, he was uh, funny. He was... Um, lively he was attractive and um more specifically he always made me laugh yeah he made you feel special of course um in ways probably other men hadn't done so before a hundred percent absolutely so the lifestyle at the beginning was it very um obviously taking you out to fancy parties fancy restaurants maybe a world you hadn't been exposed to before uh, in a way, it was, but not quite right because um, we also had very humble beginnings at first. Um, the relationship was also um, uh, difficult, let's say, in its own way due to the fact that we both had um, partners at the time and we both left our partners to be with each other and eventually we made it work and... Um, and then we became a unit and we became a family. And obviously at the time we had um, challenges, but we had very happy times as well. Absolutely. Uh, you also did mention that you um, studied uh, psychology and you were interested in I only arts. did first year. Yeah. yeah, I was, I am interested in psychology. It's just at the time it wasn't what I was really passionate about. Yeah. Uh, how did obviously starting your relationship with John uh, change your professional career, whether in psychology or in the arts? Well, at first he was very supportive yeah. to the point that he was watching all my shows. He was giving me feedback. He'd bring donuts, take me to the drama school a few mornings <laughs> a week. So he was very supportive. But then when um, we became a family and we became a unit, all this has changed. And then um, I was kind of put in a position where I had to make a choice between family and career, me as a person. And also um, it was just really challenging to be able to do both. So I chose other avenues. I did, I jumped into the world of philanthropy, the social work, uh, the beauty pageantry, the judging and all the other stuff I did as a choice. Um, and also the fact that um, it it's just didn't happen this way because of the nature of the relationship we had. And I've given up my career for his career to bloom. How did that make you feel, having to perhaps give up some of your passions for his career to bloom? Look, in a way, I didn't think it was fair because I also had passions. Yeah, and I also, at the beginning, he was supporting my passions and my needs for doing it and um, explore in my field. That's one part of the end sign. Then in another way, I was, I'm also, I became a mother, yes. I had a family and I had many obligations. Even though I didn't run a life where I was only a mother, I still tried to use my performing arts background to, um, to just make a difference in the community. Oh, that's pretty cool. I like how um, you obviously use your creativity to uh, make such a difference? How did it make you feel at the time? Look, 
I felt really good that I was being beneficial okay. and I, I used what I had to uh, support others through the charity mainly and uh, through my appearances on stage when it came to um, whether mentoring the beauty contestants at the Miss Lebanon Australia or whether giving advice to the beauty contestants for the pageant of the world or whether being on a judging panel or any kind of presence for me made a huge difference because I learned from it and I've given back something to others as well. Sounds like it was obviously a very beautiful period in your life just despite uh, perhaps maybe giving up your passion for obviously the sake of your children and entering social work but when did you start to notice a change in John's behavior specifically? Look I always thought the behavior was a bit challenging when it came to um, the need the excessive need of admiration and the grandeurs and um, the, the disrespect the going from zero to 100 in a very short time, um, the unnecessary tension, the unnecessary stress. But I always thought at first, I thought we could make it work. I mean, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. So when you stay in a relationship when things could be a little bit rocky, as a mother and yeah. as a wife, you give up a little bit to get a little bit in return. And yes. you manage and you work as an ensemble and you make it work. These are the healthy dynamics. Unfortunately, it didn't work like that in our mm -hmm. case. And um, it was continuing based on my patience. Yeah. And we all know relationships cannot work based on one person's patience. It takes two to tango and make it work. Yeah. Well, you did obviously mention that perhaps throughout your time with John that he did go from zero to 100. Did that ever make you scared for yourself or your children? Well, um, I'm not going to lie. Towards the end, it was the fear factor that was keeping us together because I was just scared to share, scared to even have a conversation with him because of how he snapped and how he reacted. We couldn't have a conversation about pretty much anything. So our relationship was being based off me avoiding him altogether yeah and um being scared of sharing all right that's obviously generally not the nature of a marriage how long did that last before for a very long time for a very long time that's why i started taking him on long trips to lebanon so people friends and family can observe the behavior okay. and perhaps can have an influence and making a change in the behavior and all that kind yeah. of stuff but unfortunately that failed too all right as in the friends and family in Lebanon did notice his change in behavior? No, they did. They did. They all agreed that it wasn't okay, yeah. but they just, it wasn't good enough because um, it was far beyond and no one could do anything about it. And considering the fact that I had so many responsibilities from making sure the public image is still running to my liking and to everyone's liking, making sure the kids are running a normal life, making sure I'm still running the household, making sure I'm still responsible of my social responsibilities and everything I created. Like it, there was a lot of pressure on me and I was taking it all by myself behind closed doors and um, considering the fact that I didn't get the needed support, yeah, I knew that it was it wasn't going to be easy and it's better to put an end to it well, especially that i wasn't agreeing on a lot that was happening around me and i couldn't do anything about it too and i kind of made me look like a partner in crime as well yeah. and i kind of wasn't because of i didn't have a say more specifically like i've never been involved in his business decisions that wasn't my area of concern yeah. it never was i've never been involved in any decisions that had to do with other stuff, other decisions. I, I was not involved. It wasn't my area of concern. So for me to just hear comments from people on the road, you criminal, you this, yeah. and my kids, and all this chaos created, it's it's really not fair. Of course. Simply because I don't have the answers for it. Yeah. I, I genuinely don't because I've never been involved. And the fact that I've been, my name's been, being brought up in all this mess is is unfair for me. Of course. So obviously you 
were probably slandered a fair bit during this time, and you did work very hard to maintain a decent social social image, distant from whatever activities um, that your husband may have partaken in that you weren't. But how did you handle the pressure behind closed doors? I'm telling you, the pressure is on another level. Yeah. Like I personally do a lot of yoga, I do a lot of um, meditation, I pray a lot. I have a very close relationship with the Lord um, that no one would ever understand because it's yeah. just, you know, very unique to us. Um, I've got faith. I believe in the universe. I believe in karma. Like I keep myself strong. But the reason why I decided to share a little bit of the story today, because I was feeling that all that's happening to myself and the kids. Yeah is very unfair of course um obviously your three young children are perhaps the most of obviously the most important things in your life oh definitely what was the impact on yourself and the kids as back then and especially now um look it's been really difficult more specifically let's talk about now yeah. during the separation and the divorce i always say in with two mature people yes and i'm not saying this situation is anywhere near normal it's very toxic it's very chaotic but it doesn't matter how bad it is the kids must come first yeah both it's both parents responsibilities to prioritize the kids yes their needs come first their well-being comes first and if one parent is not capable of taking such rational decisions when it comes to the kids, then it's the friends, the therapist, the legal team, the whole community's responsibility is to tell him, hey, what you're doing is wrong towards the kids. Yes. So I'll take you through my journey and I'll take you through many people's journeys. Talking about wiping tears and how I've obviously I've helped so many families in need. Most of the families in need have been those of, um, have been single mothers yeah. who have dealt with toxic divorces or we don't want to classify it as um, with narcissistic fathers. Let's say with the abusers, because if you're causing damage to three young children as well as their mother, regardless of what the circumstances are, you're an abuser. You're abusing these children. So I've, through my charity and through my social network, I've seen mothers who have dealt with fathers, and that's, that story is not in Australia, who had the audacity to kidnap the child, where the mother had to go to police stations and film and raise a voice and get her daughter back. Now, my question is, okay, well, you want to torture the mother for whatever reason for your selfish reasons or whatever reason you think is right. Have you thought about the emotional state of your daughter, A, being with strangers? How scared is she feeling? How neglected is she feeling? And the tra the life-lasting trauma you're causing her, does that really not matter? This is where we should all focus about and this is what the focus should be about the children's well-being the adults make mistakes i'm not saying like for instance i don't know her story or what she's done it's irrelevant to the actual situation yeah that's one story the other story multiple times during a separation or a divorce and i'm not saying she left him he left her it doesn't matter who left who a mother comes back with the children to chains on the door, to locks changed. Now, okay, before you do such a crucial, just take such a crucial decision and make such disgusting actions, have you thought about how your child is going to stand at the door and look at chains and how would you explain that in 20 years' time to your child? How would you do that? Like, what I'm trying to say, these abusers, they underestimate the impact of the abuse they do to the mother as well as the children long term. 
So you're depriving when you're okay. So what they do when they give up on abusing the mother and they they know okay she doesn't want me anymore. She's moved on. I cannot <laughs> I cannot cause more damages. Then what do they do? Then they take it on the children. Yes. How? You probably know because we shared quickly downstairs yes. that you've also like gone through yeah. it with. Yes, your mom I'm also being... raised by a single mother, ladies and gentlemen. So. Obviously, it's a very um, point of connection between us, I guess you could say. And how is that for you? Sorry, I'm not interviewing no, you're you right. now. No, you're <laughs> right. I guess we can make it a joint interview. Um, yeah, obviously, um, I don't know the how old your children are. I, so my but, children are um, 10, 10, 7, and uh, 10, sorry, 10, 8, and 5. 10, 8, and 5. Well, I was probably around, yeah, I was around 10 when it happened for me. Um, so the same age as your oldest. So I was still young, but old enough to understand what was going on. And that, I guess, just made me a very angry child. I remember in high school, I'd take it out on classmates, teachers, um, just generally whoever, whenever there was a situation where I could pick up a confrontation, I would do that as well. Thankfully, I got it all out of my system, probably around 17 years old. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I hope sincerely, none of your children um, feel like that as a teen, um, throughout their teenage years. It's not a pleasant experience, but yeah, it's obviously not fair to the kid, especially um, like hurting the mother of your children isn't, mm -hmm. is low, to put it politely. But taking on the children is a whole nother level. Uh, it's crucial and disgusting. Yeah. And usually what they do, they uh, carry on with uh, the emotional abuse. Yeah. And then it leads to a financial abuse. So let me tell you what the financial <laughs> and the emotional abuse do to the children, yeah. as you've pro probably experienced yeah. yourself. So when you're de depriving your children from, the, from their basic needs, lack of food, lack of water, lack of entertainment, lack of all these things. Automatically, the child is was used to a certain lifestyle. All of a sudden, he can't find food. Yeah. He can't find um, his um, comfort things, the, the, the initials in life. And then he starts asking the question, what is going on? And then... The abuser uses this method so you look like the parent who's not providing. Yeah. But really, they have been the financial providers. You're still doing your job. Yeah. You're still trying to carry on with life the way you've always carried, up, carried on with life when it comes to the kids. Now, they're not to make you look bad. The educational. In my case, my kids all year, the, the tutors haven't been paid. And I want to clarify it's not due to the collapse. It's voluntarily. He is not paying for the kids' initial needs when it comes. Let's talk about the educational. The tutors, my kids are used to have tutors. I'm not, I'm French educated. I'm not English. Educated. I've never <laughs> been to school, to, to school in Australia. A, for B, my kids are used to a certain way of doing their homework. Therefore, they haven't done homework for the whole year. Do they care about the educational factor? Do they care about the basic needs factor? They don't. What is their care? What are they trying to achieve from all this? To make the mother look bad, to make the mother suffer. Yeah, I can understand that. I... And the impact on the kids is huge. The medical, my child has got ADHD, the eight-year-old eight one, and that's been a bit of a difficult journey for me, even for me to understand it, because I never understood the nature of it. I knew the behavior was um, not quite right where it should be for a child his age. I knew he was acting up. I knew there was a lot going on. And then we, I got to a point, obviously, because I'm the carer, I'm the person who's always involved in the kid's life as opposed to us together, came to a conclusion that he needs a lot of help. He needs occupational therapists. He needs psychologists. He needs tutoring when it comes to his homework. He needs pediatricians. He needs medication. All of these factors have stopped for my child who's got ADHD only because his father 
has willingly stopped to pay for everything. That's the educational. Okay. The emotional trauma. The emotional trauma is huge because as a mother, you feel like, okay, well, my child needs to talk to their father. They need to have a healthy conversation with their dad. But is it healthy? Is it healthy? When the father tells the child there's seven demons in the house, seven demons in the house, regardless whether you see demons or you don't, that's not the conversation. I'm not going into that. Yeah, right. But it's not a child-appropriate conversation. Yeah. You don't sit with your child who you haven't seen for a month for whatever reason, and you talk to them in such a confusing manner. So me as a single mother, you tell me what answers should I give to that comment? Well, obviously, that would there be is very, no answer. Yeah, because I've it's a world of confusion. Of Belittling the other parents yeah. to the child, telling, calling them names, yeah, rubbishing them, making them look like they're not responsible while they're trying to do everything when they're not even here. All these, this is causing the children massive trauma, massive emotional trauma that will last for a lifetime. So in my opinion, I think uh, the best way to go about it is to stop all the communication. Obviously, the communication is not healthy and it's not leading to any way good. So better yeah. not to talk about it but unless like it's always supervised and to go in straight into family counselling when yeah. the kids are going through so much trauma. Yeah. Obviously, on I think not just the Aussie Arab media team, but to all viewers, we sincerely wish your children the best and obviously a Thank prosperous you. and successful life. Obviously, what's happening to them is highly unfair because this is their start in life. So that's really what's happening now is totally out of their hands. So oh, it's extremely them, unfair. Yeah, wish them the best. And let me get into specifics. It gets worse. So um, obviously, like financial abuse doesn't stop with yeah. it, it's 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 huge so i my daughter receives the letter from the school saying final notice if your daughter doesn't pay if you don't pay the school fees for your daughter she is not capable of returning back to school in term four he receives the emails i make phone calls for close friends and family to say that this is important yeah this is going to cause emotional stress and trauma to my daughter receiving these letters from the school, not being able to go to term four only because you decide that this is how you don't want to deal with things. So my daughter is paying the price. And I tell you specifically another story that I receive a call from my daughter's friend's mum wanting to meet with me because my daughter's friend is losing her hair. She's got bald patches stressing about my daughter. Really? I've had calls from parents. I've had calls from teachers. I've had calls from therapists. I've had calls from directors. Everyone, the whole community is raising concerns about my children and the amount of abuse they're going through. It is not simple. The abusers have to understand they are abusing the kids. Stop abusing the kids. It's not their fault. Man up, come back, do what needs to be done. Clean up the mess. Um, obviously, we, in that answer, we spoke also a bit about Jean's behavior. Um, I'd like to read something out that a reliable source for us, Arab media, said to us about uh, Jean, and I want to make sure I get this right. He called John a narcissist who has no problem burning down the world to prevent a rival from taking something from him. Do you concur with that statement? I don't know if I can even comment. Yeah. Like, look at what he's doing yeah. to my children. I was supposed to be his children as well. Yeah. So I'm now just trying to imagine how would he treat business rivals, and if I, he... I I've never had an impact, or yeah. I've never even been involved in any business decisions yeah. or anything like that anything that has to do with the business um obviously people who are not entirely familiar with the situation um have made a wide range of comments to you maybe online 
or you mentioned on the street, people who recognize you um, yell out criminal. Um, what do you say to these people now that you have the opportunity to speak? Nothing. Always be kind. You don't know what people are going through behind closed doors. The ones you see who are holding up straight, keeping a great image are sometimes the people who are struggling the most. Don't jump into conclusions. Everyone's dealing with their own problems and it's always the best way to go about things is to be kind and respectful. And if you can't help, at least don't make it worse. Yes. All right. Um, the media has also picked up a few stories on you recently regarding mm -hmm. a recent holiday to Singapore. Yay. Um, what was the context behind the media? Well, yeah, interest? let me, let me uh, just clarify something about me. I am, um, with all I'm going through, yeah. I consider myself to be um, very fortunate in many ways. A, um, I have multiple platforms to be heard. So I do have the choice to raise awareness about social concerns. I have um, the choice to tell my story if I want to, and I have the choice not to tell my story if I want to. Some people will agree on me telling my story and speaking up, some people won't. And I respect both opinions. But at the end of the day, I am what I am, and I am in a position to make these dis decisions for myself. Yeah. And um, I am very grateful as well because of the person I am. I also have the opportunities to get multiple invitations around the world for multiple events, and that was one of them. It was organized by a friend of mine who is a publicist in Doha. Thank you, Marcelina. <laughs> so she invited me to the Hip Hop 50th anniversary yeah. in uh, Singapore. And um, it was different. It was a different industry for me to be part of or be part of its celebration or success as Snoop, Snoop Dogg's son was there, uh, Russell Simmons, who is a well-known entrepreneur okay. in um, the music industry in right. America, uh, O'Neill, who's an no, American I know host. Yeah. Do you? I know I didn't even know. I got <laughs> to meet them on the night and it was... It was a great. It was um, a great distraction from all that's happening yeah. here with me. And um, yeah, this this is an example of um, a few days well appreciated. Yeah, I had a few friends as well, and I'm I'm just keeping myself with surrounded by supportive friends. Yeah, positive people with positive energy, and people who understand how the world works and always give me the best advice and. Um, just make it happy. Would you like to do a quick shout out to perhaps the most important people who have helped you during this difficult saga? Guys, you are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Whether you're a legal team who supported me, whether you're a family member, whether you're a friend, whether you agree or don't agree on anything I say or do, any feedback was helped me. You guys are my strength, and I appreciate everything. Even if you, even the reporters who were wow. really um, involved in the story, and yeah, I, I I'm very thankful. Thank you. Um, uh, back to the trip to Singapore. So, as mentioned before, obviously there's a lot of pressure on you right now. Obviously, raising three young children, um, the struggle is obviously very real for you. But at the same time, you're of course trying to. Uh, maintain social appearance, show that you're still living the best life you can possibly lead. But how difficult is it, especially right now, to obviously ma manage family affairs while at the same time managing the social, the social aspect life. of things? Um, look, when it comes to the charity wiping tears, so yeah. my last involvement was um, regarding um, the show, the Adventure All Stars show yes. that I filmed, um, and the destination was. Uh, Wheat Sunday Islands. Right. Have you ever been there? Is that in Australia? Yeah. Okay, then. Early Beach. Yeah. It's I... actually it's actually a really a, a beautiful touristic destination to take your family and and friends there. There's a lot of activities to do. Okay. That's so the... that's the nature of the show, anyway. So they raise funds to support uh, a cause. Yeah. I've supported uh, through Wiping Tears the ADHD. Yeah. Um, foundation as well as the heart of Australia yeah um, and therefore they take whoever all the members who have supported 
multiple charities on a destination where they get to uh, explore from a tourist view and ex and do challenging competitions and um, cool. tasks and what yeah. kind of competitions and tasks oh uh, i was horrible <laughs> what were they so we did snorkeling i've never done you're horrible at snorkeling i've never done snorkeling before i don't know i'm scared of fish like the big fish in the water and yeah. Sharks i was like okay scary. i'll give it a go so i was pretty much the city girl who was scared of everything really <laughs> <laughs> that's why um it was really surprising that they i received an email most recently that they want me to be part of the legends of the show oh as the well. legends yeah. and you're horrible at snorkeling <laughs> actually was we had multiple tasks that i was like for instance cycling i've never cycled even as a child oh, you're right i've never cycled oh, so one of the challenges was to do uh, mountain cycling oh that would be painful on the legs i, I, I imagine i don't know i fell off the bike straight away trying to balance on it hopefully not and I, had off a big the mountain. Bruise. I still have a big bruise on my knee all right hopefully we're hoping you don't fall off the mountain per se I didn't even make it to the mountain. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still, yeah, surprisingly, I got an email to um, participate and be right. part of the new show coming up for the legends or the people who made an impact, yeah. obviously, on the show. And um, most likely, I'll be there as well. Well, obviously, we're wishing you the best in all the Thank social you. aspect of things. But um, as but to yeah. answer your question, I've, I've, I'm cutting it down a lot because yeah. now my priority is my family of and course. my kids. But sometimes I do need to... Um, escape and i need to just be present in multiple social events and i do take the opportunities to do that because um it takes my mind away from things and also for the future it's something that i always want to be involved in okay um obviously you did mention wiping tears uh, a couple times throughout this interview uh for those who don't know or who might have missed it wiping tears is a charity which Ms. Mata, uh has been very actively involved in. She's helped a lot of people. Uh, how has the impact of wiping, what impact has wiping tears had on you, especially during a time in your life where you really felt like a lot was taken from you? Oh my God. So um, honestly, to answer your question very quickly, um, now that we advertised on my social media that we're doing this interview today, yeah. um, one of the ladies, messaged me on instagram wishing me all the luck and reminding me of when when she was going through what i'm going through today how i helped her yeah and um the through support wiping tears. through wiping tears yeah. of course of course um the support i've given her and all that and it was really refreshing because i had to ask her the question i was like i'm so sorry i've helped so many people <laughs> can you remind me of the story and she yeah, she brought back memories about the the, the family situation and um, my visit to to her and her family, and um, it was really refreshing to read that and to know that people always remember um, what you've done to them and how you've helped them. And now I can relate because now I'm going through the exact same issues where the families I have helped her, uh, exactly how it feels. Yeah. So were you able to remember her, if I might ask? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's such a touching yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, not, not quite the story, but yeah, briefly, yeah, yeah. I yeah, feel like yeah. you can make a movie out of that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, to conclude, I do want to ask you, now, obviously you are starting to move forward. You're, I'm assuming, a bit more used to um, your life now and the new challenges it has. What do you believe the future holds for Nisi Mata and her three young children? Um... Honestly, the ultimate answer to your question, I just want peace. Yeah. I want happiness. I want the calm. I haven't lived in a very, very long time. <laughs> and um, I believe that you always get what you put into the world. So I've helped so many people in the past and I used my resources and all I had to support others and um, the universe will always reward me for it. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Nissi Mata, on behalf of the Oz Arab Media team, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and on obviously sharing some very uh, painful parts of your life. Hopefully this was an opportunity to maybe put this saga to rest and keep moving forward. 
to all our lovely viewers, I'd like to also thank you on behalf of the Oz Arab Media team. We wish you the best. Once again, Ms. Matar, thank you. Thank you for having me. We're glad to have you. Thank you.